Well, this year has certainly been crazy. I dyed my hair for the first time in my life. I don't know if it shows up while I'm recording, but I've gone black, the only color that exists, and I've cut my hair. I don't look like my art assets anymore, unless I change it in the future, and for anyone who's watching in the future, hi. And on top of that, I had to record this video twice, ending 2017 on a high note. But the biggest thing of all for me this year was I started my YouTube channel. It was very slow going at the beginning, only releasing a video every few months. But here we are, about 250 subscribers later. When I started, I really didn't imagine myself where I am right now, making shorter videos specifically about certain topics. And of course that's not to say, as I have said previously, that I'm going to give up on my musical reviews or making my Degrassi retrospective. In fact, hopefully soon after this video, my next installment of the Degrassi retrospective comes out. But even though I'm not where I thought I'd be when I started, I won't trade away. I get to explore thoughts that I've always had about the show, and then see people respond to them. Now, whenever we reflect on the past, while it is important to reflect on what we did right and what went well for us, it is important to also remember the mistakes we've made and things that could have gone better. And yep, I've got a list. I think one of the biggest things that I regret were my thoughts on season 4 of Next Class. I do feel something for these characters. I'm sad to see the graduates go. I'm excited to see what their underclassmen do now that they're gone. I do feel connected and invested in these people. And I think I know why I initially thought otherwise. It's because of the release format. 10 episodes every 6 months is not a good way to keep people invested in your show and your characters. Especially with a series like Degrassi where the characters Characters are everything. With such a massive time span between release, it's very easy to forget the things that have happened previously and therefore lose a lot of context into what's going on now. And without this, it's very easy to just see it as things just happening to people rather than events occurring in the lives of those we've been with for a long time, which is the case for a lot of the graduating class and their underclassmen. I take back everything I said about not feeling anything for the characters in that season. Something else that I got wrong was Zig and how they portrayed him when he was first introduced as being poor. In my Degrassi wishlist, I wanted a character who was essentially Zig, someone who couldn't afford clothes or a lot of things that other kids felt were basic. They couldn't do things with their friends because they had no money and feeling embarrassed for not really fitting in because they're not in the same social class. I still would have wanted it to last longer, like see him have money troubles while trying to get out of the gang or while he was in the group home, but it was still a lot better than what I gave a credit for. And then on my video about did Degrassi say that mental illness is more important than physical illness, I mentioned that Maya didn't really talk about or speak up about her issues, but she did sort of. In the second episode, she did go to Miss Grell and try to to explain how she just feels so much pressure that everything in her life's just pulling her underwater and she just can't get out. But part of the reason why this didn't help was because Miss Grell misdiagnosed her. To her, it just sounded like things that normal high school seniors go through. Dresses of everyday life just becoming overwhelming. And Maya just kind of left it at that. It wasn't necessarily her fault that she was misdiagnosed, but I think she kind of used what Miss Grell said to rule out any sort of mental illness, and also put in her mind that everything she was feeling didn't make sense. She shouldn't feel stressed because she doesn't have so many stressors as she feels. Which down the road leads her to think that it must be a brain tumor or something that you can treat with pills or surgery. Not something that is not necessarily physical, it must be something with a clear solution, especially because she feels like she already ruled out her anxiety. And then another thing that isn't necessarily a mistake that I made, but an interesting thought I had. So when Zoe tries to get Drew in trouble for having sex with her and then just dumping her, what if that was her mom and not Zoe? What I mean is, what if Zoe somehow ended up telling her mom about what happened and her mom was the driving force behind trying to get Mr. Simpson or the authorities involved? She's the one who made it seem like it possibly was non-consensual. Part of me thinks that because, well, 
Zoe's mom isn't the most savory person and sort of sees her daughter as a reflection of herself. And so she is going to try to hurt those who have hurt her daughter. But then I also think it could be this way because of how Zoe reacts in Mr. Simpson's office. She's given the choice to basically ruin Drew's life or make it seem like she cried rape when someone dumped her. And she chose the latter. The thing that would obviously not be in her best interest. She doesn't necessarily hate Drew or wish him harm in that way, but she's upset that Drew left her after something so intimate and special was shared between them. And then I forgot Cam. Twice. In my self-harm in Degrassi video, I didn't mention Cam because it'd been a while since I'd seen season 12 and I forgot about that part of his storyline. And then I had to record this video a second time because while I was going over this list of things that I got wrong, I forgot to bring up Cam. I swear it's not a statement on my personal feelings about the character. If anyone wants to skip this portion, I'll put a time somewhere around here letting you know where to skip to in the video. Cam's story with self-harm is very different from everyone else's. For the most part with Cam, self-harm was more of a means to an end rather than a coping mechanism. Playing hockey was just making him so miserable and causing him so much grief in his life. Getting picked on by his teammates, Dallas berating him anytime he seemed to do something wrong, it taking away time from being with people he actually wanted to spend time with, his family, his girlfriend. So instead of quitting hockey outright and seeming like a failure, he opted to try to make it seem justified for him not to play. First was chugging a half gallon of milk even though he knew that would just make him terribly ill, and then purposely breaking his arm. He wasn't looking for the pain as a release. In fact, even when he tried that, it didn't work. During one of his breakdowns, he throws his ice skate and accidentally cuts his hand. And for a moment, he looks at the cut and reflects on it before realizing, oh shoot, I need to wrap this up and stop the bleeding. And then later, when he feels overwhelmed once more, he starts to try to hurt his hand again, but he stops. And I think he stops because he realizes it's not going to get him what he wants. It's not the act or any rush of chemicals that he's looking for. He wanted to escape his life, essentially. And he can find that escape in self-harm. Thank you so much for consuming this video, and for as bad or good as 2017 has been, I am still excited to see what 2018 brings. I can't wait to see where I'm at and the person that I'll be the next time I make a video of this kind. I hope you all have a good and safe New Year's emphasis on the safe. And if you don't celebrate your New Year's this month, happy Sunday. Thank you again for consuming this video and until next time.